Ready? Go. Listen, guys. When I went to the seminary, <clears throat> I went with my best friend, who is uh, Father Andrew today. He lives in Virginia, Roanoke. And we became deacons together, we became monks together, and we became priests together, and then we were separated. But let me tell you, when he became uh, a priest, actually His Holiness, the late Patriarch Zakka, first he was, he changed his name. So his name was Haytham, and it was changed to Andrew. And it goes, you know, like this with mostly all the priests. When they become priests, they change their names. There was an old identity, now they have a new identity. The new name that they are given is a name mostly of uh, a saint, so they have to resemble the life of that saint in their life. And it goes also, uh, this is true for uh, the bishops as well. So when someone becomes a bishop, again he is given another name. Why do, we, do they do that? Why do they do that, you think? Why? Why does the patriarch change his names? Wouldn't it be just uh, better to know the guy with his first name and you know, his familiar name? They change them. OK, go on. Yes, please. Oh, fantastic. Start you know, of an, a new beginning, right? Great. This is what happened also with Jesus' disciples. Actually, most of them had Jewish names and Greek names. So, for example, Simon, he's called Simon what? Peter. Simon Peter. So, Simon is the old name. Peter is the new name. And it goes, you know, like this with, for example, Paul. What's the original name of St. Paul? Very good. And what's the original name of Abraham? Bravo. You are doing very good Bible studies. What's the name of Sarah, his wife, the original one? Sarai. Sarai, bravo, bravo. Very good, very good. You see, you are doing some progress here. Great, <laughs> great, great. You are graduating. So this is what happens when we come to know God. He gives us a new identity. And uh, Jesus, you know, gave his disciples new names, as we just said. And also priests are given new names when they are ordained. And also, most of the baptized kids that we baptize in our church, also we give them a new name. Is that true, Abuna, in your church? Yes, it is. The the baptismal name. Baptismal name, yeah. We usually use the name of the godfather or with the doctor. Ah, okay, all right, okay. So they are given also new names as a sign of a new beginning. Great. So today, guys, right now, I want to speak to you very briefly about how to become new, which is really the theme of all of what we do uh, in this uh, convention. Isn't that nice to become a new, right? To have a new identity, amazing. And uh, before I start, I want to ask you, why do you think people, when we say becoming a new, we ask people to change, but why people are slow to change? Why? Why people don't like change, why? If you want to become new, then something has to go away and you have to acquire something new. Please, yeah. Scared. They are afraid? Very good. That's an answer. So they are afraid. But they are afraid of what? Yes. Great. So they are afraid and they are comfortable. But let's start with the afraid. What are they afraid of? Excuse me? All right, okay. Losing the comfort that they have. Okay, what are they afraid of? Again, what do you think? Of the unknown, right? If you change, then you don't know what's ahead of you. But you already know what's behind you. So you are kind of your uncomfortable zone. Like you don't want to change that one. I just want to stay where I am. Okay, what else? People are what? Again, why they don't want to change? Why? They are afraid, and they are comfortable, and what else? I know, you are looking at the papers. <laughs> Which is okay. Tell me what are there in the papers. Tell me. They are stubborn. 
People are stubborn. They got used to what they do. They are stubborn. They don't want to change. It's like a baby when you take a, a toy from him. He's stubborn. He's not going to give it to you. He likes it. You know? Okay, what else? They are trapped in their sins. What else? Number five, because change hurts, right? You need to leave something and to acquire something in you, and this is really, really, really hurts. Sometimes it does hurt. All right, so let me explain a little bit to you what St. Paul means by speaking about putting off the old man and putting on the new man. This theme was brought more than once in our, uh, you know, discussions in the small groups. But right now, I want just to explain in details what he means by that. So, one of the my favorite uh, Bible passages is this from Ephesians, which says, "Put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts." And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So what is the first thing that we have to do in order to get into the school of Christ before even graduating from that school and taking the course and succeeding in it? What is the first thing God asks us to do? Put off, right? Put off the new, the old man. Isn't that true? That's what he says. Says Saint Paul explains, saying, "Therefore, putting off falsehood," he says here, "and speak truth." So, number one, I have to be honest about who am I. All right, about my reality, about my truth, and to speak the truth about myself. Before I ask God to change me, because God will never ever be able to change me until I stand up and say, Lord, this is who I am, and this is who I want to be. This is who I am. This is my reality. I don't lie at you. I will not lie at you. That's the first thing that God requires from us in order to then take the course in Jesus' school and graduate from that school. You like graduation? Did you have a party at your graduation? Is it nice to succeed, to do well, to work hard, and to be rewarded? Isn't that beautiful? But it is the same with us and Christ. God expects us to go and get that course in Jesus' school. I'm going to speak about it now in a minute. Then he goes on to explain, but now put them all away. Anger, we said, wrath malice, slander, and fool talk. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old person with its practices. So if you are still getting angry so easily with your brothers, you should have a question mark about what kind of faith you have in God, whether you are succeeding in Jesus' school, whether you are really going to be graduated with an A plus or what is the lowest one? <laughs> F. <laughs> and then he says, wrath, malice, lying, slander, and fool talk. Even the fool talk that goes on sometimes between you and your friends. St. Paul says, you cannot do that when you are taking that course with Christ in order to graduate you know, with an A+. You can't do that. In Jesus' school, you can't. It, you are either a disciple, you are a student, you know, in Jesus' school, or you are not. You are either going to graduate or you will fail. My prayer that all of us will truly graduate in Jesus' school. So the old person, as I put it for you there, is the old bundle of attitudes and emotions and practices that I used to be. That's who I was before graduating from Jesus' school. Isn't that beautiful? That's what God wants us to put off. Okay. And then he says, well, put on something else. But before I speak to you about putting on something in you, let me tell you about someone who put off something and put on something else. He's a great saint called St. Augustine. Have you ever heard of him? 
Anyone heard of St. Augustine? Raise your hand, and you will gonna be given a million dollar. No, raise your hand, let me see. Okay, very good. St. Augustine, guys, thank you very much. Most of you have heard of him. He is one of the greatest saints in the church. You could be like him if you just follow what he did. Not in the putting off the old man because he did lots of bad stuff, but in how he put on the new man. And listen to his story. This guy was born at a time when Christianity was widespread. Spread. And I guess he was born in the fourth century. And St. Augustine was a great teacher. So he was an eloquent speaker who would, you know, give speeches and even teach people how to speak. But the problem with this guy that he got caught with a heresy. So he did not follow Christ, but actually there were lots of other heresies around. Heresy means the wrong teachings about Christianity and about God and about heaven. And Augustine was one of those people who really liked these heresies and spread them to other people. Now, the story tells us also about his mother. Now, his mother was such a righteous Christian mother. She was such a good woman who took care, good care of uh, Augustine. But Augustine, because he had to work, then he traveled to uh, Italy. And in Rome, he you know, became a teacher, as I told you, of uh, speech. And then he became a teacher also in Milan. Now, this guy was very, very famous. And he also got married. He did not really get married, but he got a kind of a child from a girl that he met on the street. You could imagine what kind of a relationship he had. So he was like a man of heresy, of bad temper, a man of, you know, you know, yeah, he was an adulterous and all of that. And then the story speaks about his mother, how much she loved him. And she was going from one place to another to look for her child, who is Augustine. And she went all the way from where? From Jerusalem and also Libya, you know, Tripoli in Libya. You know Muammar Gaddafi? You know Muammar Gaddafi, the guy who was uh, president, who was caught and killed? You know him, right? Well, St. Augustine actually was a saint in that area, believe it or not, whereby there are no Christians anymore now. So his mother went all the way to Rome and Milan looking for her son and pleading to God, please, please, just convert him, just take him, make him your child. And she was praying with, you know, uh, with tears, day and night for her child, until her child one day turned to Christianity. And he turned by, one day he was walking with the street, and he heard this boy, little boy, saying, take and read, take and read. He didn't know where, you know, the sound is coming from, but he heard the voice of a small boy. So he took the Bible and read. When he read in the Bible, he met the person, the wonderful Jesus that we have. And he was converted and he became Christian. He became Christian, but he became a very big thinker. He is the one who spoke to us about original sin. Does any one of you know what is original sin? Did you hear about the phrase original sin? Raise your hand. Fantastic, beautiful, amazing. Okay, great. This is actually coming from St. Augustine. He is the one who started thinking about original sin and putting it in that form. Anyway, St. Augustine then came back to Tripoli and he became the bishop there. God changed him. And he was changed when he was old. He was, I guess, 33 years old. He wasn't like a child. But even if you are that old, God is never away from you. You can change any day, any time, at any stage of your life. And God will so much be pleased in you. Let's go back to our handout and read here what I put for you. Putting on the new person. So putting off the old person and putting on the new man, the new person. So in Jesus' school... You are renewed, so you put on the new person. St. Paul says, put on then as God's chosen people, holy and love, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience. That's what you need to put on in order to become a new creation. 
But what are the requirements for graduation? That is the question. What are my requirements? There is this beautiful parable that Jesus told about a wedding feast. And here how it goes. One day Jesus told this beautiful story called the parable of the marriage feast. The marriage invitation was thrown open to anybody who would come. But then Jesus says, but when the king came in to look at the guests after sending his you know, slaves to get all of those people from the streets, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. What is this wedding garment that Jesus or the king looked for when he came to check his guests on his banquet. That's a wedding feast. And the wedding feast here means actually the kingdom of God, when we meet God face to face tomorrow. And God expects all his guests in heaven to have that garment, the wedding garment on them. And that's really the new man that we have to put on. And listen to what I just wrote for you here. Many churchgoers today will be shocked when Jesus returns. They think it is enough to wake up early Sunday to go to Christ school, but never leave their former life and get graduated. When the master says, change your clothes, they buy new clothes for Christmas, and they won't take off those cherished habits. They won't strip away those old attitudes of racism or the love of money or the addiction to pornography. They want to be in heaven, but they won't dress for heaven. And that's what makes us like liars before God. We want to be with you in heaven, but I won't, don't want to dress in heaven. You don't do that for your graduation. You know the party they throw for you at school for your graduation, right? Don't you, they ask you to dress in suit for men, to go and dance with the girls. And no one is allowed to go into that hall without really being neatly dressed. So it is the same when we go to heaven. God expects us to have a garment, garment of righteousness, of holiness, of love, of patience, of forgiveness, of long suffering, of a sacrificial life. Without it, you cannot go and meet your Lord. But don't be afraid. If you have done anything wrong, God is always ready to forgive you to forgive you. Now the description of the coursework. Let's read here uh, or just listen to me. Christianity is not like any other school. It is not a moral self-improvement course. You don't just sign up and work hard to change yourself. That's the school of legalism. In the school of Christ, change comes in a totally different way. By grace through faith, as Paul puts it, so that the schoolmaster gets all the glory, not the students. Why do we say that? Because in the school of grace, your new clothes are what? Created, St. Paul says. So you don't really acquire these new clothes that ask, God asks you to put on you on the wedding feast or when you meet him. They had already been created for you. And St. Paul, somewhere else actually, says that God has created us for good work. God had already created these good works. I go only to perform them. I don't really go to create them. It's a kind of saying that I don't take the credit for doing what is good. I don't boast about it. I don't say I am better than others. You know, I have done this much, and this guy did this much. He took all the praise. I didn't take the praise. He took all the glory. I didn't take the glory. In God's school, in Jesus' school, it is not the student who takes the praise and the credit. It is the master, the teacher who is Jesus, who takes all the praise and the credit. I say that because it's so fascinating. 
It actually helps us to live a healthy life. Whatever I do, whatever you do, I don't look at you as being really the originator, origin of the work. It's God who created that work for you to do, and you are only performing it. So it is God who works through you, and God who works through me, and God who works through him, and God who works through her. Whoever does a good work, Jesus says, let him say about himself that he is a sinful servant. Whatever good work you do in life, stand up and say, Lord, all glory goes back to you. You have created this good work for me. I have done my job, and I give you all the glory. May they not praise me. May you get all the credit, because I am a sinful servant before you. This is a true Christian response to when you do a good work or when you see other people doing good work. This is what Jesus said. He said, let them see your good works and do what? Praise you or what? What did he say? Praise, glorify your Father in heaven. That's what he said. That's what he expects you to do as well. Not to concentrate on yourself, but on God himself. All right, guys? Isn't that beautiful? Great. So what am I supposed to do? If these works have been already created for me, what am I supposed to do, Abuna? I know when I go to school, I have to work hard. But do what do I do? In the kingdom of God, if God had already created this work, well, listen to what Paul see, says here. So here I am in the school of Christ. I believe in him. He tells me that I am his workmanship and that the new person I am to become is his creation and the works I am assigned to do are already prepared by him before I even do them. So what in the world I am supposed to do? Okay, the answer is, Put on the new person, as Paul says. But how do you put on a bundle of attitudes and emotions and practices that God has created? The answer, St. Paul says, is be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Think differently. Listen to God's word. And God's word will change how you perceive things around you. You might still have the same problem. You might still live in the same house. You might still face the same issues. But you, when you put on the new man, you will look differently and you will see differently. Let me give you an example. Recently, I heard about this man sitting in uh, the train. Do you have a metro here? We have a metro in DC. Do you have a metro here? Great. So he was sitting there in the metro, and there was this other man sitting with his kids. But the two kids were running in the metro, making all of these noise, and you know, singing, shouting. And he, the guy was just, you know, his head was in between his uh, hands, and he did not move. He didn't speak to his kids. And the other man who was sitting beside him, he was very, very angry. Why this guy doesn't show any concern, not about his kids, but about us who are sitting here? So he said, I turned to him and told him, sir, could you please, is there a way that you can make your kids a little bit quiet here? He said, I, I don't know if I can make them more quiet. Uh, he said, I asked him, why do you think you can't make them more quiet? He said, well, I just came from the funeral of my wife. And these kids lost their mother. They don't know how to express it. They are running around, shouting, singing, crying. Me being, sitting here still, I don't know what to do. The guy said, well, how I looked at the situation after the guy told me the story was so much amazing. I actually looked with compassion at the kids. And what, you know, had been happening, the noise, I couldn't hear it anymore. I started actually to feel so much sorry for them. And I had mercy on their situation. And this is what happens when you meet God. 
You might have the same situation. You might have the same annoying cousin that you have in your life. You might have the same annoying teacher in your life. You might have the same annoying dad that you have in your life. But when you know Christ, you would look at them differently because you are changed. You know a different story that they don't know. You know Jesus and they might not know him and you are called to live accordingly. Isn't that beautiful? that God changes our perspective. Isn't that beautiful? I think you are saying yes right in your heart. Thank you very much. Okay, guys. So how do you become renewed in the spirit of your mind? The answer is to fill the mind continually with truth about spiritual, eternal, heavenly reality. He says in Colossians 3, Verse three, 2 to 3, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So fill your mind with the truth of heaven, so that the deceitfulness of this world was pushed away or may be pushed away. So that's what he is asking us to do. We renew our mind by filling this mind with spiritual reality, with the things that we cannot see, but in faith we know that they do exist. And these things that I trust that God has for me in store will change how I perceive things in my life. They will change me. They might not change the situation, but I will be changed. I will look at things differently. And then here, Paul says, Renew is, renewal is not one-time job or it is finished. We are actually renewed every day. And there is this beautiful verse from Corinthians. Paul says, we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed every day. Every day you are renewed with God. Every day God works with you. And every day God expects you to listen to his voice and to respond with, yes, Lord. Let it be to me according to your word as Virgin Mary responded to the angel. That's a stand of faith that everyone has to take to become truly Christian. God, brothers and sisters, I, as I wrote here, renews you every day by giving you the right emotions, the right attitudes, the right practices that has created, been created specifically for you. All of these will clothe you with righteousness and holiness. And this new person that you become is indeed the creation of God himself. And to him belongs, belongs all the glory forever and ever. Say, Amen. Amen. Before we end, I'm going to tell you two stories. As you know, I like stories. Yes, yes I know. So, okay. We go with the first one, which is very, very sad. Now, guys, I was in Ireland for six years, as you know. But in my fourth year, what happened was very, very disturbing. I had this nun who was studying with me, and she came to me and said, Fadi, would you please, 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 please speak to my sister, Amber? I said, yes, why not? What's wrong with Amber? She said she has what is called severe depression. I said, severe depression? She said, yes. And she tried to commit suicide more than once. I said, oh my God. Is she seeing any psychiatrist? She said, yes. She, there are actually some physicians who try to help her. So I said, OK, let me speak to Amber. But I prefer to go and visit you and visit your family than speaking on the phone. She said, yes, of course. So we decided to go. And I did go, actually, to their uh, village, which was in north of Ireland. So I went there, and I sat with Amber. I spoke to her. We slept, I can't remember, one, two days. And me and Amber became very, very, very good friends. Actually, Amber started to like me, to call me every day uh, you know, on the phone and speak for hours. She even came all the way from north of Ireland to Dublin to see me and to speak with me. And I thought everything was going well. And 
Then I got to know the story, why she is severely depressed, because she thought something happened before the death of her brother. Now her brother, unfortunately, also committed suicide in the home. So she thought that her other brother, who was still alive, is the abusive one, and he is the one who made you know, set up this death of his brother. And she thought, I think it was wrong, but she thought that he is trying to do the same for her or he has done something in the past for her. So I did not believe her story completely. But Amber, you know, tried to commit suicide again. And she was caught, like by her sister. And they took her to hospital and they cleansed her stomach. And she was well again. And Amber tried to commit suicide again. They catch her again. They take her to hospital. And she is cleaned again. She was 20 years old. And then one day, I was leaving to Syria. Every summer, I had to go to see my family. So I left in the summertime. While I was in Syria, I, re I received this disturbing call from Mary, her sister, the nun. She said, Fadi, I said, what? She said, Amber died. I said, don't please tell me that. She said, she killed herself. I said, how did she kill herself? She said, we don't know, but what happened that she took a walk, uh, she took some drugs with her, and she swallowed them, and she was found dead. I said, oh my God. Mary, she said, what? I said, did she leave anything behind? She said, she left absolutely nothing. She actually burned all her pictures, all the letters that she had, everything that belonged to her, she burned it before the death. I said, oh my God, that's really very strange. She said, why? I said, didn't she leave anything behind? She said, no, 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 she didn't, absolutely, she didn't leave anything behind. I said, okay, that's fine. So after two days, Mary calls me back again. And she says, she said, Fadi, we found something. I said, what did you find? She said, I found a painting. I said, is it heaven and earth? She said, what is heaven and earth? I said, is it like, it looks like heaven and earth? She said, yes, it looks like heaven and earth, blue and brown. I said, oh my God, that's really amazing. I said, what, what is there on the painting? She said, on the back of the painting, Amber has written to Father Fadi, thank you very much. It broke my heart. I still have the painting. But what's the story of the painting? One day when I was visiting them, Amber, as a way of treatment, she was given this task of painting, you know, to paint and to describe her feelings through colors. And Amber started to paint a lot, a lot. When I saw her paints, I liked them. I said, but I like this one a lot. Would you give it to me? And she said, no, I'm not going to give it to you. It's mine. I said, no, Amber, really, I like it. She said, no, I'm not going to give it to you. And, you know, I left without really taking that painting, which I really liked a lot from her. But then, you know, Amber is now with God, I am sure. And uh, she left that painting, you know, it really uh, breaks my heart whenever I look at it with these words. Why am I telling you this story, disturbing story? Not to make you afraid of death, but really to tell you that some people do lose hope. And this is a reality. You know people around you. You know some friends. You might have been actually where Amber was, but you don't need to take that action. You don't need to stop, you know, living. Jesus came so that we may become in you and we may have, listen to this, joy, everlasting, and peace, everlasting. And Jesus said something else, the fullness of life. We Christians, because we know Jesus, we have joy, peace, and the fullness of life. You don't lose hope. No matter what, you have a greater God. If your problem is big, you say to yourself, my God is bigger. Isn't that true? It is. And this is what this guy, Ra'ed, did. 
he was actually, uh, don't stone me, a Muslim guy, who came, who came to our church. And this guy came from Syria. And uh, with his family, he decided to become Christian. So when I asked him, why do you really want to become Christian? He started to explain about Islam and things, this and that. And then he started to speak about the beauty of Christ that we have, that's really, we, that the Muslims are deceived. They don't know Jesus because, they, you know, they get him through Quran or through their clerics, but they don't know the real Lord that all of us know in the Bible. And then I, of course, baptized him, and I baptized his wife, I baptized his two kids, and now I'm going to baptize his brother. So all of them are becoming members in our church. But the good thing, the beautiful thing about Rad is this. He is there every single Sunday. He comes first to church. Now, believe it or not, he reads Syriac. Abuna, how about that? He reads Syriac. You give him Syriac, he reads it. How did he learn it? On YouTube. His last name is a Muslim name. He said to me, Abuna, when my children grow up, I'm not going to leave them with this name. I said, what are you doing, Rad? He said, I'm going to change their name. I said, what are you going to give them, a new name? He said, yes. What is the new name, Rad? He said, Ephraim. That's the most beautiful name they could have. You know, when they grow up, they will never, ever know anything about Islam. I want them to know only about Jesus Christ and about the Syriac church. That's what they did. And even... Uh, you know, started to attend our Bible study, and he rarely missed any Bible study. That's what happens when you become a new creation. You put on Christ with new attitudes, a new outlook, new feelings. Things might still be the same around you, but you have changed. Your perspective has changed about life. I pray that all of you may be like Ra'ad. Say amen. amen. Thank you very much. I have finished. <laughs>